physiology breakdown and stages of a woman's menstrual cycle, how training volume intensity should be, should adapt to their cycle stage. No, I cannot. Um, that question is difficult and I don't like it. And I will tell you why I don't like it and hopefully answer actually the question in the process of doing that. Um, so first and foremost, the female menstruation, um, I guess beliefs, myths, misconceptions, is that it, we are all one size fits all. And that's just not the case at all. Um, at the end of the day, every single female out there, their menstrual cycle is incredibly innate and unique to them. Um, and when we think about the menstrual cycle, we not only have to think about what it is like today for them, but what it was like in the past and also what other methods might have been used to change or adapt the cycle. So I'm going to start and I'm going to try to do, um, I guess, a little bit of a background context first and then I will get into the actual, like, you know, follicular phase and all that bullshit. So women's menstrual cycle 101. Um, Menstrual cycle, typically speaking, happens, uh, I mean, we're talking usually early preteens, like 13, 14. Um, it actually is though, they're starting to see with the research, population health research, that it's happening earlier and earlier, and the belief is uh, that is linked to both uh, potentially underlying ideas around oh, obesity, fat cells, adipocytes, but also the hormones in our food. Um, so with that being said, our menstrual cycle evolves as we are going through puberty. Um, it is not finished growing or I mean having a, a, some type sense of like normalcy or set point until we are out of our teens. Um, however, common occurrence is manipulating through oral contraception. Uh, when you manipulate it through uh, birth control pills, at a young age, you are really changing the due course of your kind of let's just say the, the future of your menstrual cycle, because you're adding in variables that really aren't supposed to be there. Um, I'm seeing in, in my work, because I, I do research around the menstruation cycle and oral contraception in athletes, that we're not only influencing it through drugs, but we're also, in, or there's a fly and it's just really liking me right now. Um, we're influencing it through our training as well. So let me reverse here. I told you this is going to be all over the place because this is just a really fucking complicated question. Um, hormonal adaptations happen through birth control, through training, also through, you know, just the process of us going through puberty. So for individuals that are maybe in our industry that are females that played sports growing up, you're kind of having this trifecta happening. So by the time that you are, say, 25 years old and going into the gym and want to get in shape, there's a whole bunch of shit you need to account for before you can even start to conceive, which is a stupid idea of manipulating your training around your menstrual cycle, because you can't. End of story. Um, but hormonal adaptations happen with training. Hormonal adaptations happen with oral contraception or other types of drug use as well. And hormonal adaptations happen just as the as it relates to the individual. There are underlying genetic things that can influence our, our cycle. There are underlying other systems in our body, such as our thyroid, that actually influences menstruation, our adrenal function that influences our menstruation. Um, I mean, even just the dietary effects influence menstruation. Um, and other, I'm not even getting into all the different kind of influencers, but there's a lot that goes into this. So for me, the whole notion that we can train for our menstrual cycle is bullshit because how do you actually know what's happening inside that individual's body? Even if you're doing blood work, it's going to change from month to month. If you are doing, um, basing your pre-assumed programming off of whether or not an individual has menses. Menses doesn't actually mean a lot. Somebody can have high estrogen and have menses. Somebody can have low estrogen and still have menses. Somebody can have high progesterone and still have menses. Somebody can have relatively low progesterone and still have menses. Somebody can have high and androgens and still have menses. Somebody can have, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So it really can't be controlled through the minutia. And at the end of the day, research on this in terms of like the, let's say thermogenics that happen with certain phases of your cycle or uh, substrate metabolism, that whole notion gets completely attacked 
when you start to introduce things like hormonal adaptations. Um, because an individual's body is going to have different type of hormonal adaptations at any point in their period based off of all that shit that is happening in their past and what they are doing today. So, well, the notion is cute. I don't get it. I don't buy it. What I do, though, truly believe in is that people need to train for their own bodies at any point and they need to use their biofeedback to help with this. And what I mean by um, biofeedback is, especially as it relates to like menstrual cycles, is some of us have really shitty periods and we probably don't wanna squat if we're worried about the floodgates opening mid-workout. So that's something to consider. Uh, but after ovulation or in the ovulation period, our, often what happens is our basal metabolic temperature goes up, which means that we actually are hungrier Usually the research suggests it's about actually 500 calories that the body needs in excess during that period of time. So if you're somebody that notices that you're, and you can actually just do a, a basal temperature for this, that your body temperature is going up and you're a hungry motherfucker, eat. Put more food that is good for you, good for your diet, good for your body in your plan, because that's going to be a lot better than you binging on something that is going to be completely counterproductive to your health and your goals. Um, if you're somebody that is, let's say, gets really bad cramps, well, cramps are going to cause inflammation. The moment they come on, get them to go down through using an anti-inflammatory. And yes, this is a synthetic anti-inflammatory. Um, what research has suggested is that you can dramatically reduce your prostaglandin production, which is your um, inflammatory, essentially, I'm not going to go into all that science though. It just happens when your body is inflamed and it's why you both shit and flood at the same time on the first day of your period. Uh, fatty acids, not so much fun. But you can reduce that through having a anti-inflammatory at the onset. So as soon as you have the inkling that you have a uh, cramp, take something. That is enough, the research has suggested, to drop down the inflammatory markers to reduce your prostaglandin production to also make it so your period is not going to be excruciating or excessively heavy. This is another kind of tool that's used especially in that um, premenopausal period uh, when you are having a higher, in or a higher chance of really, really excessive, hard, heavy periods. Um, another thing to keep in mind here is that you can have ovulation without having menses and menses being the actual blood itself. Um, it happens. It happens to a lot of people. But what you need to be diligent of, or individuals need to be diligent of, is tracking again that biofeedback. Do you have slimy mucus in your underwear? If you do, track it. See if it happens the next month. It means something. Again, not going to go into a huge amount of details, but that is something to track. And this is far beyond the cute little apps that people get. This is actually looking at our basal temperature, our hair growth, our hair loss on our heads. Um, our discharge, our cramps, our moods, our appetites, our acne, and do this for at least three months and see, see where you're at. Even if you have regular menses, but you're somebody that experiences say really bad, bad water retention around your period, that means something. That's important to understand, it's important to track, and that is what we need to start getting individuals and our clients or whomever we're working with to start thinking about. It's innate to them, it is very individual and it is so contextual because the minute that somebody starts going into say prep or a massive caloric deficit or anything like that, this is all going to change. We have to be adaptive, we also have to be proactive though, and try to put measures in place so people don't have this epic epic shift with their sex hormones every time they pick up a weight. So thank you for that question. I know I completely butchered it, but unfortunately it's really fucking complicated. So thank you for the question. If you guys have any more or would like to learn more about menstruation, please let me know. Um, I can in a future video maybe break down the actual stages of like menses, follicular, luteal, all that jazz. But again, that's something that's it's this very utopian idea of the menstrual cycle that research is slowly getting it out to the world to tell them that really that's not, it's not that cute. We don't have cute little curves um, in terms of like the ways our estrogen and progesterone and LH and FSH and that, the, yeah, we just, it doesn't work that way. So. There are so many myths around menstruation, um, and in time, I hope that we can tackle them. So thank you guys for watching. 
please feel free to comment below and check out my website for more information.